Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed lunch. My name is Rocio. I am a research um, foresight associate with eCampus Ontario, and I am delighted to be here to introduce our next keynote speaker, who I have had the pleasure of working with for the last three years. Our next speaker is Dr. Nicole Jensen. She is the executive director of the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association, or CDLRA, where she leads annual longitudinal research studies exploring pan-Canadian trends related to digital learning at post-secondary institutions. Her primary research interests include tracking macro-level trends in digital learning at post-secondary level, defining and operationalizing key terms associated with digital learning, investigating faculty experiences with technology, exploring the future of higher education, and better understanding how adults learn informally in digital contexts. So without further ado, welcome Dr. Nicole. It is a pleasure to be here. This is always one of the highlights of my year, uh, presenting at CHESS, and I'm excited. Some of the data I'm presenting today, um, just we just wrapped it up, so it's less than a month since we wrapped up our fall survey. So this is very new, very fresh. I'm gonna be presenting from both our spring and our fall, and there's a, there's a lot of nuances to the data this year. I think Bonnie's presentation was fantastic. She covered a lot of sort of the underlying themes. Um, you know, I'm gonna be presenting charts and tables, but between all, underneath all those charts and tables is a story and that disruption and the things that are happening behind the scenes, these complex conversations, those all exist under the data. So that's important to remember as we are uh, going through today. So a uh, quick few things, uh, if you're in the room and you're not familiar with uh, the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association or the CDLRA, as I'll call it for the remainder of the presentation, we are a nonprofit organization. We've been conducting annual surveys, uh, pan-Canadian surveys since 2017. And our surveys have evolved a bit over the years. When we first started, it was one response per institution um, across Canada. We changed that uh, after the pandemic. We wanted to hear from people in different roles. So when I'll, I'll explain that a bit more when I'm talking about our participants. But we still, we reach out across Canada. We conducted it at the beginning once per year. Uh, there was this thing that happened in 2020 and all of a sudden <laughs> digital learning became much more um, center stage, a huge area of interest, and there were more topics to cover. And so we divided our survey into a spring and a fall survey. Uh, that allows us to ask about more topics, but without uh, overburdening our survey respondents. Um, and our research it focuses on uh, digital learning practices and trends in post-secondary education. So I, I wanna take a minute and I want to just quickly uh, highlight our sponsors and partners. As a nonprofit organization, we could not do what we do without the support of sponsors and partners. So uh, eCampus Ontario, since the beginning, has been one of our biggest champions. They fund our work. We are so grateful for eCampus Ontario and what they do and the fact that I'm able to be here and present this. Um, so thank you to Robert and the entire team here for that. Um, our other sponsors are BC Campus, Campus Manitoba, D2L, Contact North, um, Ministry of Quebec, and the Maritime Provinces Higher Education Commission. We also have our partners, uh, Bayview Analytics. Uh, I know, I think Jeff is watching me on the live stream, so hello to Jeff uh, in Oakland, uh, California. Bayview Analytics has worked with us since the beginning as well, and uh, Dr. Jeff Seaman and his team there, they work on crunching our numbers and producing these wonderful charts that you're gonna see. Uh, we have Academica Group, which has uh, been, again, a partner since the get-go for us and really helps to share our survey through the Academica Top 10. And we have WCET in the US, who again has been with us in the beginning and has really helped support our work over time. And I've done some collaborations with uh, WCET this last year, especially on uh, definitions, which I'll talk about in a second. 
And uh, so if you're interested in that, please come see me after. I'm happy to send a wealth of uh, resources about definitions your way. So talking about our survey, we had two. We had our spring pan-Canadian survey and our fall one. The spring one, uh, we had Canada-wide 438 individuals representing 126 different Canadian institutions. In Ontario, we had 66 individuals representing 35 different institutions, um, and I've got the specific eCampus Ontario membership responses there. One of the caveats that we have is, so these findings I'm presenting, they reflect uh, those who are in administrator and staff roles. And by that, I mean senior administrators, teaching and learning leaders, um, deans, directors, um, educational developers, instructional designers. One of the areas where we, we need help is getting faculty responses. Uh, we did ask for faculty responses. We just didn't have a huge uptake this year. So that is, if you're wondering, well, why aren't faculty voices included? Uh, we want them to be included. And on the last slide, if you are a, a faculty member here, I'll be sharing a QR code that you can use to um, sign up to receive invitations to our surveys when you get them each year. Um, and then, so this is really funny, well, at least to me as a researcher, for our fall survey, we had the exact same number of responses, um, 438, and I actually asked Jeff, is that like an error? Like, is it, am I actually presenting this uh, correctly? And he said, yes, we actually got the exact same number of responses in spring and in fall. They do not necessarily, does not necessarily mean the exact same people. I know it's not the exact same people who responded. So it's not the same person necessarily who responded from spring to fall, but we have those responses. Um, again, Ontario, this re uh, represents 72 individuals in 35 different institutions. Um, if you're curious about how we get the surveys out as well, uh, it, we have a roster. Um, again, that's where if you're signing up to receive our surveys, that would put you on our roster. We distribute our surveys that way when they come out. We also have our partners and sponsors who um, send out the survey for us as well, try to get the word out, it's shared on social media. Um, there's a number of different ways that we are recruiting and getting uh, interest. So that's how we're getting our participants as well. All right, so this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk to you about trends. I'm going to talk to you about digital learning challenges. And I'm going to talk to you about feelings about the future. And there's a lot of charts here and a lot of information. I'm going to try to leave about uh, 15 to 20 minutes for questions at the end because I know that there's with the year it's been, um, be, building on a, the past few years of uh, different things coming up, um, there's a lot. Uh, so one of the key things um, I always like to talk about is definitions. This has been a critical part of my work, is making sure we're all talking about the same thing, um, or thinking about the same thing, sharing the same meaning when we're talking about online learning or hybrid learning. Um, I could do a whole presentation just on this, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to leave it here. But just to make it clear that when I'm talking about online learning, I'm talking about learning that happens, you know, entirely online and it is in, you know, it's delivered by the internet. It's got those characteristics to it. But understanding that that can be delivered in a number of different ways, like synchronous online, asynchronous online. The online learning encompasses a lot and hybrid learning encompasses even more. So hybrid learning is that partially online experience. There's some mix of in-person and online learning. So when I talk about that today, I'm talking about that in the broadest forms, knowing that that can be delivered in a number of different ways. So going on to the trends that we saw this year, I'm going to share a few trends on student and faculty preferences modality and technology trends, and OER, and of course, uh, what has been a big topic this year is uh, AI. When I talk about the student and faculty uh, preferences, uh, just to caveat that, this is the respondents' perspectives of student and faculty uh, preferences. So this is not necessarily what students think, although our respondents often base their responses on um, surveys that have been conducted at their institution. Um, faculty as well, this is based on their observations and perceptions of faculty um, preferences and experiences. 
we would absolutely love to have faculty voices as well. So um, yeah, those caveats there. Those uh, student preferences, uh, overwhelmingly positive towards technology use. And I think that that's been a common theme that we've heard. I have certainly haven't talked to anyone who has said that, oh, my students want less online. Although some students, and we see that there, there's certainly some students who prefer to learn entirely on campus. However, it's only 10% who, you know, our respondents were agreeing that all or most students wanted to learn entirely on campus. For the most part, what this chart tells me is there's a mix out there. There's some students who prefer entirely online. There's some students who prefer entirely on campus. A lot of students, you know, prefer the option of learning online sometimes. So whether that's being in a hybrid course or being able to take a mix of online and in-person cor uh, courses in their program. That flexibility is huge. But regardless of modality, there's overwhelmingly this positive, uh, you know, they're feeling positively towards having technology use in their classroom. And that's important because when we talk about in-person learning now, we need to talk about in-person learning as also being technology, you know, including technology in that experience. It's very rare now to have an in-person learning experience that doesn't have some sort of technological aspect to it. In terms of faculty preferences, um, we found that, you know, our respondents felt that faculty actually feel, you know, fairly positively towards adopting new technology. So regardless of modality, there's that interest in integrating technology um, into their practices. And I want you to hang on to that piece of information because we're going to come back to that uh, in a moment with that interest and um, that, you know, preference where, you know, our respondents were saying that, you know, 50% of them were saying that all or most, uh, you know, faculty at their institution prefer the option of teaching online sometimes. So this narrative that, you know, faculty know they just want to go all back to the way it was in 2019 or, you know, there's a lot of faculty who taught with technology prior to the pandemic as well, but this sense of faculty resistance towards technology, our data is not supporting that. Um, there's some, again, like the students, there's some faculty out there who prefer to teach entirely online and not have that mix. There's some faculty who prefer to teach entirely in person, but we see for a lot of the part there's that mix, that having those options to either teach in hybrid courses or again, teach you know, an online course one semester, teach an in-person course in a different semester, but that, those skills are needed because we have faculty who want to be using technology. Modality trends, um, this is very consistent uh, with the past two years. Uh, I kind of feel like a bit of a broken record coming here you know, year after year and saying there's this trend towards hybrid learning. Um, there is a trend towards hybrid learning. We, <laughs> we, so we asked in this, or this question, we asked our respondents, what is the likelihood of the following happening over the next 24 months? And we asked them compared to the present state. So this is not what they think is going to happen compared to, you know, 2019 or even 2020. When they were answering this question in spring of 2023, they were saying that in the next two years, so between spring of 2023 and spring of 2025, they're expecting more courses being on, uh, offered in A, the online, well, in the partially online format, so the hybrid format, but also in fully online. Um, we're seeing actually in Ontario, this was interesting because I didn't see this so much in the rest of the country, but this interest in multi-access. And so multi-access, that would be a high flex would be included in there where students have the option on any given day to decide how they attend class. Um, we're still seeing more courses being offered fully in person too. So I don't want to, I don't want that to get lost in there. About just over half of our respondents said they do expect to have that increase uh, more in person. So, but we see for the most part that increase happening in the hybrid and in the online space. Technology trends. 
Well, across the board, when we asked our respondents, nearly everyone said that they expect to see uh, greater technology use in the next 24 months. So that's between spring 2023 and spring 2025, they're expecting greater technology use. So that's very interesting because we see, you know, now there being so much more technology use happening since the pandemic, and yet we're expected to see more. The, the data is telling us that there's an expectation that that is going to grow. So I'm really interested actually to see how this question develops over the next two years. We're going to be asking this again next year, and we want to get those data points to see if we're still seeing increases in a few years time, or if we're kind of, we do eventually hit this sort of settling point where we've hit this plateau, um, but we haven't hit it yet. And that, uh, I think the data is very, very clear on that. Same with alternative credential offerings. There is that expectation that those are going to grow. So micro credentials, badges, uh, stackable credits, all those things is what we uh, sort of include in the alternative credential. And that's um, going to grow. Same with uh, support for the use of OER. And we were expecting to see that. And I'm going to talk a bit more, too, about some of our OER questions we asked just recently in fall. So we asked about OER awareness uh, in general. And really interesting, um, I think Ontario was actually, when I, when I kind of looked at the data by, by region and across the country, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Ontario was really had leadership in this space in terms of OER awareness. Um, and uh, you know how they not just awareness but how OER can be used in the classroom so if you see like we've got 66 percent who are very aware of OER and how they can be used in our respondents we have an additional 25 percent who are aware in some of their uses um, very few people in uh, of our respondents were unaware of OER or had little familiarity with it uh, what's interesting, though, is because we're seeing this greater, uh, you know, likelihood of more OER adoption, we're seeing a strong OER awareness. Um, with the OER stuff, I'll, you know, as a sidebar, um, with Bayview Analytics in the U.S., we are doing some data um, analysis with them and looking at uh, Canada and the U.S. together and looking at some comparisons. And um, in that, we've been able to have this understanding, and especially with the work that Bayview's done over years and years, uh, OER awareness in general tends to be related to overall adoption. So that tells us if there is a strong awareness, uh, just based on data that we've seen in the US, that that's likely to lead to adoption as well, which makes it interesting when we look at the policy that you know, just under a quarter of our respondents said that their institution had you know, a formal published policy for OER. And then another 18% said there was some sort of informal policy. So this just tells me based on a potential increase in OER use uh, over time, there may be a need at institutions to develop more formal policies. There's a bit of a gap there. So that's just, that's just something that stood out to me as I was looking through the findings. AI, uh, we've all heard about that this year. Uh, it's funny because I think back to when I was on the stage a year ago in November 2022, and uh, AI really didn't come up a lot. It was sort of on the periphery, and then chat GPT happened. Uh, it's hard to believe that it's been like a year uh, since you know it, this wasn't this huge topic, and that's AI has dominated a lot of our year. Um, my colleague and uh, CDLRA's co-director of research, uh, Dr. George Valetianos, he wrote a special uh, dedicated report on AI with our findings from spring. Um, we thank D2L for sponsoring that. Um, that's a really great in-depth resource. It also provides sort of caveats around this specific chart. Um, the data here, we, he found when he was really looking and doing this in-depth analysis on our AI that sometimes respondents, like when we looked at the country as a whole, uh, there would be respondents from the same institution who gave very different responses 
to this question on whether there were, <laughs> yeah, re regulations, guidelines, or policies on a AI. So bear that in mind that our respondents to this question, there might have been a policy, they might not have been aware of the policy. And so we're going to dive into that a bit more next year as we look back and reflect over the next couple of months on how we're going to redesign our survey on you know, how we ask this question next year um, and how we, again, continue to examine what, you know, the number of institutions that do have policy. And it's emerging. Um, institutions, again, it's been less than, it's been less than a year that, they came, that this came up. So the fact that, you know, 17% of our respondents said, yes, there were established AI policies, that tells us either those were developed beforehand or those were developed very quickly in response. Uh, AI, we asked in the fall, uh, building on our findings from the spring. So this is fresh data from just like people who responded less than a month ago, um, that AI will become a normal part of education. And that seems to be the overwhelming sentiment here. So to some extent, um, you know, Nearly all of our respondents, or the vast majority, said, yeah, it's going to become a normal part of what we do. And I think that ties really well to, uh, with what Bonnie talked about and her point to, I don't know that we can disentangle ourselves from it at this point. So when I was looking at this data, it sort of, I sort of said, huh, like this, uh, this tells me that regardless of how we feel about AI, and I'm not saying to shelve our concerns. I think our concerns are incredibly important and need to be a part of the conversation here. But I don't know that it's an option to step away or say, oh, well, we're not going to incorporate it or it's not, it's not going to happen at our institution. It is. Um, there was a lot of sort of mix with uh, the, you know, for the most part, there was agreement with all of these statements, sort of the positive and the negative, you know. Students will use AI as a study tool. Students will use AI to cheat. Um, it can be used to make courses more engaging and effective and efficient. It can also make teaching more challenging. And I think that's what I've heard and seen this year. With AI, there's two sides to the coin. Um, and that's like with a lot of technologies. There's potential for problems and there's potential for benefits. Um, and I'm really interested to see the kind of data we collect in the upcoming year and um, really to see how this conversation unfolds over the next year as we become more experienced and familiar, pardon me, <coughs> with putting AI in our classrooms. Okay, talking about some challenges, and AI has certainly presented them, but there's others. <laughs> I'm gonna talk about operational challenges, teaching and learning challenges, um, some of the teaching competencies, and that's where I'm gonna bring in that, um, you know, that previous uh, piece where faculty want to be teaching um, and you know incorporating more technologies and professional development. So in terms of operational challenges, the key point here is that there was nothing that stood out above the rest as a key operational challenge. For the most part, what we had put on our list, and this was sort of based on a question that we had asked last year and some of the open-ended responses that had come in and we created a list, but we're not seeing that operationally there's any like thing that stands out as a striking big challenge. For the most part, all of these things are uh, causing a challenge to some extent. And to give uh, just a bit more context to this chart and the next one, we asked our respondents to select any uh, any of the things that were challenges at their institution. Um, and then we asked them from their, what they selected to put what was their most pressing challenge. So this is what they said was their most pressing challenge from the list of all that they selected. And in the Ontario report will be coming out. I will likely be released early in the new year. And in that report, we'll have the further breakdown of that first uh, bit of data of what, when everyone kind of selected all, what were the frequencies. Teaching and learning was different. Um, there was definitely a challenge that stood out above the rest, and I don't know that it'll surprise anyone in this room, uh, academic integrity. And I think it's important to remember that uh, we were seeing academic integrity as a challenge prior to 
AI chat GPT, that just, AI, it, it just shone a spotlight on a pre-existing challenge. When I was doing this work and this research during the pandemic and during the early days, over and over, one of the first things that came up was, well, if students are learning online, it will be easier for them to cheat. And we saw problems with online proctoring and all sorts of complex issues around academic integrity before uh, we saw chat GPT you know, come into our landscape. Um, and then all the other challenges that were most pressing, again, it, those were kind of like the operational ones where you know, nothing else stood out as a, they're, they're all there, they all exist. But certainly academic integrity is a conversation that we need to keep happening because it clearly is a challenge uh, at our institutions right now. Equity, diversity, and inclusion. And this is, so this was really cool to ask some questions about this in the fall. And actually, I don't have a chart for this, but one of the questions we asked in our survey was directly related to one of the questions that came up at this presentation last year. And it was, you know, well, what is, what is meant? Like, people tend to carry different meanings about EDI. Like, when we're asking about EDI in our surveys, you know, do people understand what, you know, do they carry that same definition of it? And uh, so we asked our respondents to say, what's their personal definition of EDI? And again, the data is very fresh in this, but when I've, when I've had a chance to look through it, uh, it's all over the map. So with that in mind, so when people are talking about incorporating EDI principles into our courses, there actually might be meaning a bunch of different things. So there's some error bars on this, um, this chart here. Uh, so more work is needed. First of all, um, I'm going to be going through the data we collected on EDI, uh, EDI and that qualitative piece, and I'm going to probably be putting together some sort of extra report on those findings because they're really, really interesting. But we need some more work done on operationalizing what we mean and having that consistent definition. We did ask a couple questions that were a bit more specific, so like preparing faculty to, to teach diverse groups of learners and providing wraparound supports for students. And we asked our respondents to give their institution a letter grade, like, you know, give them an A, give them an F, give them something in between. And for the most part, uh, our respondents gave them something in between. There's a lot of like, okay-ish, right? They're doing, institutions are doing okay-ish. Not a lot of people said, you know, uh, that they were getting an A, not a lot of people said they were getting an F, but there's a lot of uh, Bs and Cs going around. So that says that for all these different things, there's room for improvement. Another challenge is our teaching competencies. And this is where I would love, again, to be able to stand here a year from now, having asked the same question in our 2024 work, but having more faculty voices to compare this to. So our respondents, who were mostly, you know, who were non-faculty, uh, were asked whether faculty at their institution had the skills and know-how to effectively teach. And if you notice, it kind of goes down. So the least technology integrated experience, so fully in person with minimal tech, there was a general sense that faculty have the skills and know how to teach well in that environment. All or most faculty can do that. We go to fully in person with substantial tech and that confidence goes down. We add fully online, confidence goes down. Partially online, confidence goes up a little bit, and multi-access uh, access confidence goes way down. So when we consider that there's that faculty interest in teaching with technology, and there is the trend towards more technology, and we've got this gap here in terms of the perception of faculty competencies. And so that's, again, uh, more research is needed here, but more conversation is needed here. One of the key challenges that when we talk about competencies, we automatically go into professional development. And when we looked at professional development, we asked about new faculty, and then we asked about ongoing uh, professional development for faculty. 
that's required. And so about a quarter of our respondents said it was required. There wasn't a difference necessarily in terms of modality for professional development requirements, which is also really interesting. If we know that faculty, there's a sense that faculty have the competence to teach, um, you know, in person well, but not necessarily, you know, may need more help to be teaching with technology. And our professional development is kind of like, you know, we need more. Um, and that's a, it's a challenging uh, topic, actually. And I was just talking with the people at my table who I was sitting at lunch, you know, with at lunch. Uh, there's constraints like collective agreements, all sorts of things. When we talk about experienced faculty, so this is just our new faculty here prior to teaching. All faculty ongoing professional development requirements go way down. Voluntary, like it's there, voluntary professional development is there. So our institutions are putting it out there. I think that's really important to note. Um, you know, all, most of our respondents said that yes, there was some sort of professional development at their institution ongoing for faculty. But again, we don't see that difference either in modality that, you know, that there's more for online or more for partially online. Like it's, these, I, I again, I looked at this data when I saw it. This is from the fall, and I thought, like, there's more work that needs to be done here. Um, I'd love to do more research, and I'm going to look at our surveys for next year and see if there's a way to kind of unpack this a bit more and find out what exactly is going on. And sort of with those things in mind, I want to talk about one thing we asked that was really interesting in the spring, and that was thinking of the future. So we've got all these things, you know, coming up, happening, you know, we've got, you know, our trends that are expected, we've got our challenges that are impacting uh, technology adoption, growth, ability to teach online. With all of that, how are we feeling about the future? And so, in the spring we asked some questions, and we know that the past few years have been a steep learning curve. We know that there's been a lot of changes. And so, we wanted to know, first of all, whether more change was expected. And so we asked our respondents whether they, think, again, thinking from right now to five years from now, whether they expected post-secondary education to be different. And we had just over a third who actually still expect it to be very different from now, here in 2023, in five years' time. And then we had another 50% who expect it to be somewhat different and nobody in Ontario expected it, or from our respondents in Ontario, expected it not to be different. A minority said slightly different. What's really interesting is if when you look at the next chart, um, you see readiness for change. So we, we ex asked them if they expected change, but then we wanted to know, were they ready for it? Like, do they feel like, if, especially if they're expecting big change, is that gonna, are they gonna be ready? We have 22% who said, yeah, they're ready for what, change might come. We had most of everybody saying, okay, they're somewhat ready. So that's really interesting to see that we still are expecting big change, but actually our respondents are feeling somewhat ready for it. There isn't a sense of impending disaster or doom. We do have this readiness there. What I found really interesting, and this is, you know, after talking about challenges and everything there, I wanted to end on uh, you know, a positive note. So this, I hope, will give some hope. So with all the things we described, all that's happened, you know, in the past few years with the pandemic, with the AI, with learning curves, with challenges, in Ontario, for the most part, our respondents are actually feeling optimistic about the future. And I think that's really critical. There's been a lot of change. There's been a lot of things that have happened, but people feel hopeful about what's to come, even when expecting a very different future, they're feeling hopeful about that. And if they're not feeling hopeful, they're feeling, they're feeling neutral, okay? So that's good, that's, that's a good thing. Very few people are feeling pessimistic. Um, so yeah, with that in mind, uh, I just wanna, again, thank you for giving me this time. I've left uh, time, lots of time here to answer questions. Um, 
I want to let you know, please feel free to email me, um, reach out to me. All of our publications from this year will be put up where it says CDLRA, like the publications uh, page. That you can check there and you know, within the next few months, we'll have all of our 2023 reports uh, put up there to give that in depth. Like I said at the beginning too, if you want to be on our list, so if you want to receive invitations for the survey, please scan the QR code, sign up to be on our roster, uh, and you will get emailed when our next survey comes out. And we would love to hear from you, especially if you didn't feel like your, your feelings were reflected in the responses. If you felt like you, what you saw was very different from what the majority was there, please um, participate. We'd love to hear from you. So with that, um, I'm open to questions. There was a lot. I put a lot in front of you in this hour, right after lunch, too, with everyone sort of feeling that lunch uh, tiredness. So I, I'm open to your questions. Yeah. Oh, this fun second. Thank you. Um, do you have any vetting processes for uh, the people who are submitting their answers to your surveys to make sure that they're knowledgeable about their institution? So you mentioned sometimes you'd get very different responses. I'm wondering if you have vetting questions at the beginning to sort of figure out, like, who is this person? Where are they placed within their institution? How long have they been there? That kind of information? Yeah, for sure. So when we ask on all of our surveys, we have a demographic section. And so we're asking what institution they're at, we're asking whether they've taught in the last 12 months, we're asking what their role is. Um, what we don't want to do is we don't want to, we, we want to take that information and bear it in mind. So we, we know from our respondents this year that they were, you know, qualified. They're representing, you know, public post-secondary institutions and that it's experienced there. We don't want to get to the point where we're, you know, disqualifying people because they haven't been in that role long or they haven't been teaching long because it's really important to be getting newcomer perspectives and experienced perspectives in there. But yes, absolutely. We have that information and we take that into consideration when we're putting these charts and stuff together to make sure that, you know, it's, it, it's representative of what's there. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Do you did you, in your demographic collection? Do you collect data about race and age? Yeah, this is it tricky when we've talked about that? Um, we don't at the moment. Um, a there's survey the issues of survey burden on that, but it's an important point in that. Um, yeah, it's it, it's a tr it's a tricky one because it's a survey burden, but we it, it does allow insights to know whether you know what our sample population is. I would say right now, um, based on what I know of our sample, um, which is the confidential things which I can't, you know, necessarily give breakdowns of, I'd say it's fairly representative of what you would see higher in higher education in general. Like, I don't feel like our sample is misrepresentative of the, like, higher education um, makeup at most institutions. Does that answer your question well? It or does. You I mean, specific to the EDI findings, yeah. I feel like that's that's over-optimism <laughs> on <laughs> how, how institutions are doing with EDI. I'm curious to know who's who's speaking yeah, on behalf think, of that issue. Yeah. I think if we had more uh, faculty responses, that might change what we saw. That's one of our reasons, too, for working to expand our roster and having people in different roles. And that's one of our goals for exactly that reason, to start seeing my hope is that in a couple years' time, we could break some of these findings up by role, and I could say, well, you know, ad administrators feel this way, and teaching and learning leaders feel this way, and faculty feel this way, and actually show you three different charts rather than the one. Uh, so I think right now all those responses are kind of merged into there, and that's sort of the, it's sort of the average of those responses. But yes, absolutely, if we were to break it down by role, we may see very different responses. Thank you. I am actually looking forward to reading more in depth into the report. Um, the question I wanted to 
kind of ask and just some clarification around the survey as well. Um, we talked about um, like, I guess, instructors use, organizational use, um, the institutional use of especially technology, but my focus is on the learning gaps or within instructors as well as the learners. Um, are you looking maybe in the future just to capture that information? Because I find from experience within my role that I find implementing a lot of the technology is great. It's a shiny tool, mm -hmm. but then the learning gap within the instructor and the students are very, very important, and a lot of the time that is missing. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'll sort of answer it in two ways. I think part of the answer is will is covered sort of in my previous answer, like asking my roles. The more we can get that roles, we can get that more information. What we try to do is we try to ask every year some qualitative questions. Uh, they don't make it; they make it in the reports, but they don't necessarily make it into like these presentations. Um, but we certainly. I think there's a need to unpack what's happening there in terms of that gap. I think there's also a need in terms of that uh, perception. Again, I, you know, showing those slides on faculty competencies, for example, I'd be very curious to see how faculty rated themselves compared to how they're being perceived. And if there is a gap between those two, what might be the reasons for that? Um, you know, may, might it not just not be that the people who were, you know, giving their perspectives are actually seeing faculty in action are they basing it all on you know student responses and uh, you know those sorts of biases that come in there i think there's also a need um which i i hope that we might look at you know in the future to ask questions about the why like why are these things um you know what why might uh there be um, less professional development uptake. Why might there be this need, uh, you know, or faculty interest in teaching and yet this sort of gap between competency? So I think there's a lot more that can be uh, going, going there. And I guess that's another thing to throw out here too. Uh, I'd love to hear even from this room, um, what, you know, what do you think based on at your institution, what needs to happen uh, at your institution to kind of either close that gap or are you seeing something else at your institution or has your institution found solutions for like faculty development at that work and students is important too. getting students uh, ability to use technology as well uh, is really critical. Hi, sorry, I was just actually going to ask. So these surveys are not they're only for faculties, right? Not students. No, so yeah, we don't, we don't ask students. No, that's a, yeah, uh, one of the reasons for that is it kind of opens up an ethics can of worms for us. Um, okay. But one of the things that we know uh, just from our conversations with people who have responded in the past is that many of our responses are based on student surveys. So they're not just drawing information, you know, from the top of their head or their opinions. It's based on what they've seen in student surveys at their institution. Hi, sorry, I know we have one more question. My, I have another question, and that is, um, do you guys ask um, if these faculty members, like how long they've been in Canada, if they've studied here, and then are teaching here, or if they're need, I just wanna understand from like, the immigration perspective, yeah. I guess, because it is different, right? If you've studied elsewhere, and then you come here, yeah. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so right now the question, is that, the answer to that is no, we don't ask that. And again, it's from that survey burden perspective. Um, in order to get, it's always a challenge with research of, uh, in order to get as many responses as we can to get the most responses, we have to really limit the questions we have. We try to keep our surveys at 10 minutes or less. And so the more questions we ask about demographics, it means the less questions we can ask about the, what we want to find out about in terms of trends. So I, 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 I agree, like for those things, I'd love to know them too, but I, it's always this balance each year. And our, our research steering committee goes through this every year and goes, okay, like where do we, where's that give and take with that? Hi, um, I'm Juan. I am from the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies. Uh, when you were presenting the different categories, first of all, I would like to see the report. I would yeah. love to see the report. Um, 
a few things that came to my mind is that perhaps for a future study, thinking about that some institutions are heavily decentralized, mm -hmm. you might see these responses vary from one faculty to the other. And, and, and the other thing that, that came to mind is that if you are thinking about respondents that work on the on degree, degree programs mm -hmm. versus continuing education, you're also gonna see a significant variance in there. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And we've, we've seen that too. And I think that's an important point to make. Like when I share these surveys and these results, I'm sharing a whole um, like amalgamation of things. So these are the, we do have people from, you know, continuing ed departments who respond. We do have people who are from, you know, other like degree, like pro programs who are responding. Um, so those responses are incorporated in there. Um, I think as well, you made a very good point. Like the responses, when we look at individuals specifically and individual institutions specifically, I, it, it's so situated. I did another research study uh, outside of my work with CDLRA um, in BC this year on uh, student preferences for online. And um, when we looked at an institution by institution basis, it was very clear, and I know the same is on t in Ontario, um, every institution is so unique and so different that if I were to ask this set of questions at one institution, I may get um, a very different set of responses, a, a tables and charts that look very different from what I presented here. And if I asked another institution, I might get a, you know, a whole set of tables and charts that look very different from that other institution. So the data that I present is that merging. It's, you know, everyone all together and what are we seeing when we look at the picture at once? But I think you made a very good point that within this data, it represents a whole constellation of different types of uh, institutions, different types of programs, different types of learners, and different types of needs. And it's important to remember that in there. Good. <laughs> well, I just again, uh, as a wrap up, if there's no more questions, I really want to thank everyone today. I, and I thank again e Campus Ontario for inviting me back this year just to share these findings and results. And please, like I said, uh, feel free to reach out to me at any point. Um, I'd love to hear from you and I'd love to hear what's happening at your institution specifically because that helps me to better understand and interpret this work year after year as I hear just the stories and these informal conversations about what's happening on the ground. So thank you very much.